Welcome. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm Stacen Berg, Senior Director here at Hauser & Wirth. Just quickly, today's program was graciously sponsored by the Goethe Institute, and I'd like to introduce their director, Lean Heidenrich Salem, to say a few words. Thank you, Stacen. Um, my name is Lien Heidenreich Seleme. I'm the director of the Goethe Institute here in Los Angeles, the German Cultural Center. And we are extremely excited and proud to be part of this initiative of Hauser and Wirth um, today um, to host this um, prestigious conversation between Julian Rosefeld, Kate Blanchett, and Christy Edmonds. Um, for us, this event is part of a larger initiative, which we call Wunderbar Together. Um, it's the German-American Year of Friendship, which started um, three weeks ago with an electronic music festival here in LA. We had a German film festival, and it will be actually more than a thousand of events um, over the course of one year all over the United States. Um, so we are very happy that um, we are part of this and um, to be hosting um, Julian Rosefeld's um, exhibition and the artist talk specifically here. And I want to thank Stacen and Hauser and Wirt for this wonderful collaboration. Thank you very much. We'd also like to acknowledge the community support from the Creative Artists Agency and the Center for the Art of Performance at UCLA. Uh, Julian Roosevelt's 13-channel film installation, Manifesto, pays homage to the moving tradition and literary beauty of artist manifestos, ultimately questioning the role of the artist in society today. If you have not already, please have a look downstairs. It's in our galleries until January 6th on view. And now just quickly to introduce our participants, we can get started. Julian Roosevelt is a Berlin-based artist, internationally renowned for his visually opulent and meticulously choreographed moving image artworks. Mostly presented as complex multi-screen installations, his works are showing internationally at museums and film festivals and are in many important public collections. Kate Blanchett is an internationally acclaimed award-winning actor and director of both stage and screen. A recipient of two Academy Awards and three Golden Globes, her contribution to culture has been globally recognized. Christy Edmonds is the executive and artistic director of the UCLA, UCLA's Center for the Art of Performance, one of the nation's leading presenting organizations for contemporary performing artists. And now it's my pleasure to hand it over to Christy. Thanks, Stacen. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks, Hausler and Worth. Um, just quickly, because I think it's going to help me get a bit of a gauge and probably these guys. How many of you have experienced this work and, and been in there and really looked at it? And how many of you have yet to do that? Okay. How many of you liked it? Yeah. How many of you liked it? Now, this is where every arm. You wouldn't be here if you didn't like something in relation to it. Um, Kate, Julian, I wanted to, um, you know, it's interesting because the amount of... Uh, interviews and conversations you have had in relation to your collaboration together on this project. I mean, I did my homework and I read quite a bit, and there's a lot. Um, and it's a very generous uh, way of looking at the work, but one of the things that I noticed is that more often than not, the questions of what, how did you, et cetera, et cetera. But because we have a short amount of time, I wanted to start with something that's more around the urgency of why you know, why this piece, you encountered these manifestos, and at some point, an artist is, in my experience anyway, usually there's one thing that just grabs you, and from that piece, everything starts to unfold. So, the, the why behind the manifestos, maybe starting with the text. So, I would, I would probably give another answer to that question every week, since I, or every month at least, since we created it, and since the initial idea. It was triggered by another project. It was triggered by uh, the research for an homage to Louis Bunuel, which became a, a, a film, an installation called Deep Gold, for which I focused on feminist theory and I found, um, or on the feminist aspect of Louis Bunuel's film. 
and I found uh, some marvelous feminist manifestos during my research, and they echoed in my head and remembered, reminded me of my, my poor reading of artist manifestos while I was studying, so I went into rereading those manifestos. And by that time, uh, Kate and I had already met, and the idea was in the air to do something together, so I thought like this could be something that I would love to do with her as I started reading them listening to her voice and seeing her in different characters. And so that was the starting point. But another answer to your question would be, um, there's something, there's, I mean, artists do sense things maybe differently, no matter if you paint or film or whatever. And we are inter interrogating the world we live in through our art. So that's basically why we do art. It's very selfish. We want to see ideas become form that we have in our mind. And again, no matter if you're a painter or a filmmaker, I think the artists among you know what I mean. It's a very selfish way of just, I want to see that done. But it's also we are trying to understand the world through our work. And I can only say, maybe come back to this later, and I pass the word to Kate, but I can only say that the work has, for me, become another one, as the world we are living in has become another one over the last two years, a scaring other one. And so I constantly keep on learning from that project, from the research and also from the result. And I hope that the work is, is un incomplete. Uh, it, or it's completed by you as an audience. And constantly, I keep on learning from it. Mm. Nice. So Kate, I mean, you, in this work, but in all of your work, I mean, the, the extraordinary facility and agency and craft you carry. Um, as, a, as an actor. In this work, you've developed multiple characters to occupy these extraordinary visual word, worlds, but also a text, a text that is, I mean, unusual, right? I mean, they're, they're meant to be read. Sometimes it seems they're meant to be shouted or screamed from the rooftops or something. How did you approach these manifestos together from your craft? Well. Often the, the, man, the manifestos are nonsensical in the in the kind of the mise en scène that that, that Julian put them in, and yeah. and that the um, some of them lent themselves more. I'm just talking really prosaically. Yeah. Um, lent themselves more to dialogue, and some of them lent themselves more to inner monologue, but often they work contrapunctally with with the situation that they're in, and people talk about them as characters. I never really oh. thought about them as characters at all. Right. There is no um, psychological preparation. We literally had four hour, like a four hour costume fitting. Yeah. And then the night before we, we'd literally say, all right, well, this one will talk like this. <laughs> and then, and then, and then the night I said, well, I've used up that accent. What do we do? Okay, well, this one will talk like that. You know, it's, it was really very um, in the moment. Um, it was more, it was more like a, um, a moved reading. So, uh, to, to me, there wasn't a lot of psycho there was no psychological preparation whatsoever, and I really welcomed that, because yeah. often you can overthink things, um, and so, and, and in, in a way, I felt that the process for me was embracing the temporal nature, that film has somewhat lost uh -huh. in the digital age. I think. Say more about that. Yeah, well, I, I think I mean it's 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 happening, so you may as well work with it, but. Um, I feel with a lot of digital effects that it's, it, everything's going to be cleaned up or changed in post. And so the atmosphere that one captures on, on set, the human temporal nature of film, which is personally why I got into it in the first place, that's somewhat lost in, in, in the process. So I was really excited about claiming that, that very sort of visceral, visceral immediate um, space that, you know, and also speaking to a different audience in terms of the why. You know. Yeah, but also in these manifestos, I mean, the, for those who have seen it, there's, there's multiple screens that are carrying uh, each of the sort of worlds of the manifesto and the inhabitants of it. But the sights are staggering. I mean, staggering. So a, a little bit of your process, I mean, being able to get a, gain access to some of these sites and spaces, which are truly remarkable and almost otherworldly. And for me, many of them, uh, they struck me as this kind of um, obsessive way in which past human ambition activated these giant 
you know, architectures and fabrics or industrial spaces, and now they're left in decay. And to me, they hearken to a warning. What are we doing that's like that now that will decay later? And how do we think differently before we make that kind of choice of ambition? But the access to those sites, I mean, how long did that take? Well, I must say, you won't say this. Yeah. No one says no to Julian. I mean, he has... <laughs> You were, you were so positive and, and yeah. you know, in an unaffected way, charming, that he could, you know, you could talk your way into anywhere, so. I buy that. <laughs> <laughs> but let me add up to the question you asked Kate about the, the impact with the text, because I think the, the fact that we had no time to actually rehearse uh, yeah. this text together was actually, and we worked around it with many, many tricks that we might talk later about. Um, was, was good in reference to the actual subject of, of what we wanted to do, is to pay homage to these manifestos and, the, and this common energy that all these manifestos share. I think the fact that she just jumped in each and every scene, each and every day, not only location-wise and character-wise and makeup-wise, but also art direction-wise in a completely different world, um, helped to enhance and, and peel out the layers that covered these original texts. You know, these texts are always seen in context with the visual work that these artists created, but the idea was to get to the very nucleus of the, of the, of the text itself, of the poetry of it. And I guess like not allowing yourself to prepare for that, and just of course you need a fantastic actress to do that, not allowing you to prepare for that helped to, to enhance that very fresh energy of the texts of each and every text itself. And to combine this with your question about the sides, I mean, uh, location scouting is a little bit of a thing I like to do, but um, I, I do like to combine in my work, no matter if it's a found location or a set we create for the very scene, to com combine it in a, again, non-logical way. So in cinema, in art of cinema, uh, architecture, set design, whatever, even costumes, even music, always helps to announce, understand the audience what's going on. Right? It's, it's there to make it easier for you to, to see what's going on. And that's not so much question. And you can actually discover a lot more sometimes when you allow a text to unfold in a setting where it doesn't belong to, because it activates you as an audience much more. And I do that in, 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 in many of my works that I um, research on patterns of filmmaking or fake reality creating in, in, in film by not combining text and action, uh, text and, and sight in a, in a logical way. And so you all of a sudden need to know something, uh, need to make something out of that. Why is this text happening in this very location? It's also, I mean, I, I do think that, you know, you always asked, which is, I think is an important question, uh, why one does this. But in the end, I think, because you want to explore what it means. And that, you know, uh, as, an, as an artist, you know, and, and certainly as someone who's working in film, you're not all, and definitely in the theatre, you're not always entirely in control of, of how it's going to be consumed or the meaning of it. And then that's why, you know, when I'm working in the theatre, the most exciting time is when you go through the, the, the tech, through the dress, and the first audience, because then the meaning of the work is completed. Right. And, it's, and, and the time in which something is released, you, you are completely out of control of. And, and the, meaning, the meaning of the work mutates, yeah. I think. Also that you, you um, I mean, of course you try to understand why you're doing what, yeah? But I found out over years of making art, I found out that the, the strongest moments, at least later on when the work is ready for the audience, actually those where I couldn't, myself couldn't make sense of, where I didn't know exactly why I did that. So I try also to, for instance, to invent uh, for the characters in the work little ticks or things they do. They have the little secrets even in front of me, although I kind of created them or co-created them. But I don't know every. I don't know why they do exactly what they do, and I think Kate is, uh, has been an, an amazing partner on this because she has also that attitude of learning while she's acting. So she would, in the it's really I often said there must be some witch power involved when she starts acting. Although you you, you talked about everything before in this, but all of a sudden something comes over you. I don't know how you described that, but it's very clearly there. Panic. <laughs> Panic. Panic is a good way to put it. Or I need it to go to the bathroom. Right. <laughs> it always looks like something's going on. Delivery. <laughs> but there's a surprise element in it, right? And that's, yeah. 
but, but in your process, so you would know the sites or various sites or be in the process of doing that with your team and trying to find out wh where all of it's going to be. Then there's the reality of get the equipment on this day and this time. And you said you had to shoot it in a very short period of time, in part because of your schedule, right? No, because we no. have no money. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, well, time is money, and therefore. Um, yeah, my, so, my fee was so huge. There was, <laughs> but no money. You know, for the artists that are also in this room, the process that you would have gone to to hone who, who was going to be wh what, I won't say character, but what persona, what person, what personage were you going to be? Was that determined in advance, or did you read what he was after, start thinking about it, and then while you, you developed that, you who, did the, the order inhabitant in, of the these order worlds. in which we'd shoot Not it? the order, but the, the, the characters. Character scene that, fitting. That aren't oh. characters, but they are, kind of, for yeah. us, humble um, human mortals. Yeah, we like, didn't. Some did of them... you say, this has to be a homeless man in this space, in this time? Or was it determined in a kind of loose script that it would be? No, no we, we, we met in New York, and, yeah. and we sort of had a, uh, an afternoon where, where Julian yeah. had sort of like 50 scenarios and 50 different personas, characters, whatever, and, and then we sort of cross-matched them. Um, and then some of them were a bit one-to-one -one right. and a bit literal, and then you went away and, and then determined them. So we had like I worked on parallel tracks for a long time, like on one on one track, like re-editing, reading a lot of manifestos and trying to find out which ones speak most to me or what, which which ones should be in this work. Of course, the main isms of art history of the 20th century, but also many discoveries, and then re-editing about at the end about 55 or 54 manifestos to this. 13 text collages, that was one thing to do. And the other thing was collecting ideas for sceneries in which a woman, and once a man, the homeless man, uh, delivers a monologue. And then we started to exchange these ideas before we met, uh, playing a bit of idea ping pong. And Kate came up with a few characters as well. And then it was kind of instinctively, sometimes logical, maybe sometimes very illogical, sceneries, characters, and text collages merged. And again, for me now, some of the most illogical are those who are strongest, or where maybe the source of the idea was just in a fragment of the text, like in the Dada funeral scene. It's a very strong scene, I think, yes. where I found a little fragment in the text, and that, 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 gives, that gave the idea to the text. But then when we met, um, it really started because we had to say goodbye to a lot of beautiful ideas and characters. Yeah. And as you just said, somewhere maybe two or characters, let's, uh, Kate likes to call them, which I think is a great description, rather vessels for ideas, because yeah. they were not really characters, right? They're more almost caricatures sometimes. Mm. And so some, uh, we had to say goodbye to a lot of funny ideas, but maybe basketball because they were coach, I was a bit sad the basketball oh. coach went. Yeah. <laughs> maybe another well, time. You would have been a great coach. <laughs> because some of them have like they're archetypal or they seem like they're, you, you can't imagine this newscaster, for example, the news anchor, those kinds of words coming from the news anchor and yet the technique of the vocal delivery is so, I mean, it peels back the artifice of, of the, the newscaster as well. I mean, there's a lot of complex layering across how the physical embodiment of these vessels are from your, you, how they're, you know, the placement in the screen and the composition, they're, they're both like these immaculate choreographies um, in, in time and space and being. It's, it's remarkable. So the process would have been, you would have, I imagine, been as surprised by seeing that persona come to life in front of you. Especially if Kate Blanchett does Yeah, it. no kidding, right? Mm. But, but, but so much, I mean, it's, I had a director in, a, in a, um, one of the first plays I did out of drama school say to me, no one wants to see your homework. You know, and it was, it's, it was really great not to do any homework and to just literally be alive to the space. Um, you know, because the space actually gives you a lot of meaning. Context is meaning. And so, you know, I, I could have sat and done study about newscasters, although who needs to do that with the 24-hour news cycle? It's all, that rhythm is so inside our heads, you know, you can be, you know, it's very easy to, to bring up. Um, but it was very much about, 
you know, it's, it's always good, whether you're making a film or, or working with a visual artist, it's, it's always good to know how it's going to be shot um, because it's, it's always how it's going to be looked at that, that, um, that, that gives you a sense of audience, I think. And maybe I talk a bit about how it was actually done. Yes. Uh, because normally each of these texts would be a, a, a theater monologue which you have to rehearse for weeks to yes. memorize it. And there was no time for that. And even working with the best actress in the world, you have to have tools and tricks to, to manage that. And so, again, I think it helped the project that we recorded, for instance, every evening after long shooting shift, we recorded in the, in the hotel where we met again with the sound guy, the text for the next day, without any accent, because she also has to, had to deliver 13 different accents. And we would record this in two different speeds, so she would have a little clip in the ear and be able to, while she was acting, listening to her own recording from the day before, which is just, just but try, that was, try that, that was at home. for the pitch tone? That was, that was there for the pitch tone, and then we had the, um, you know, sometimes text plates in the background, like in an American TV show, or a hidden smartphone in the plate when she was saying grace, <laughs> where she could read from. Keep in mind that all that means that what you are doing there, you have not only to translate it technically into language, but you have to feel what you're actually reading and seeing and thinking about it. And I'm still very, personally very uh, blown away by what you have done in that very moment when the camera was rolling. Sometimes we had just one take. And we said, like, this is exactly what we... What, it couldn't, couldn't get any better, and, and that's extraordinary. Would you describe it differently? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's also often, often when um, you know, you're performing a play, the whole process of rehearsal is to get back to the instinct that is uncovered in the first reading. Right. And when you're working this quickly, you just have to work, work off collective instinct. Mm. And that's a really exciting way uh, to, to, to work. It's yeah. sort of, um, you find the group mind about, about what you're doing. Yeah. But it was, yeah, I, I, I did my only panic about it because um, I do think I have a lack of a healthy lack of consequence about work generally. I think it's the only, it's the only way to keep doing it. Otherwise, you'd ah. kill yourself. Um, uh, but uh, but my only panic was about the amount of text and how we were going to, to deal with that. And then Julian came up with this earwig thing, which coincidentally I'd, I'd done with on a Terence Malick film, oh, okay. um, where he likes to sort of speak a whole lot of things that he's translated from Heidegger. <laughs> In your ear, <laughs> but then the problem—the problem is that sometimes Terry would drop out, and I say, "What was that, Terry?" And so, and so he speaks this, this, you know, because he'll give you the night, you know, the, the day of. He'll give you 16 pages of poetry. You think, Terry, I, I can't learn this. He said, "Oh, well, I have this little, I have this little, this little thing. We can, lines. yeah." So it's it's an interesting way to, yeah. to to work. But but obviously, you'll see those of you who haven't seen it each. Uh, vessel character, whatever you call them, turns to the camera, and so I'd, I'd hear this beep, and I knew that that, that was the pitch tone I had to hit, yes. and then, and so then I, the night before, in a very flat way, I would record that text. So if I'm looking a little bit like this, it's, <laughs> it's because I'm constantly You're actively listening. listening. Like I'm yeah. actively listening to myself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's madness. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. So the way that works is for you to, because you might wonder how that harmony is created all of a sudden, it actually happens every 10 and a half minutes, that's the duration of each and every loop, or they have the loop at different points. Um, so there's, there's an accord behind that, just imagine having 12 fingers sitting on the piano and creating that one accord, which has a little uh, twist in it actually. And so you had these 12 notes, and she had the 12 notes, different notes for different characters in the ear. And then we know before that when we once then synchronize these 12 spoken pitch moments on that level and the other one on that level, that would come together as this one embracing moment, right? Yeah. So it's pretty magic, but very simple. But, and, for, and for me, that was, that was part of the most, one of the most exciting ideas um, that, that, Julian, that I found that Julian had for the whole the entirety of the project is that when you read these manifestos, and I'm sure many of you have, it's, they're, all, they're all sort of very strong, energetic, often youthful assertions of dif difference and individuality. But when you hear them together, and the wonderful way that this is presented you know, in a non-linear version, 
is that you get to get the, you find this energetic similarity that they all have. And particularly when they hit the pitch tone, all these assertions of difference, yeah. assertions of difference, they're, they're all so similar yeah. energetically, yeah. which is really, I find, I find quite interesting. It's interesting to, to hear them again, or you know, if we read them in art school or theater school or wherever, whatever school we're in, or to hear them in that kind of choral environment but also to, to, to recognize the, the, the claiming of a future. The energy is this kind of declaration of claiming a future and the past going somewhere else and various other kinds of things. And they do, they have a youthful naivete, but there's an agency in the time they were written from the authors that's saying, I claim that future. Actually, I declare they're, they're not it, I really... will it to be, and I can. And I wonder how often we do that now. But they're not really addressing the future, actually. They're, mm. they're saying bye to the past, but yes. they really talk about the present day, about yeah. the very now. And that's, yeah. that's what makes them so energetic. Yeah. And why I think that the, the audience often feels it like a, almost like a call for action, yeah. that it is directly activating you. It's not about what they say, it's about how they say it, uh, how these texts speak to you as an individual engaging in society. And in that, in that sense, I hope the piece makes sense today. Yeah. You know, you were speaking a little bit about that idea of an absence of consequence that allows you to keep going, mm -hmm. right? And I think, you know, when we were speaking the other night as well, it's not an absence of consequence, but you reflected earlier on, like, the role of the artist. And part of this is a question about the role of these artists in the manifestos, but the role of you as an artist, you as an artist. And to me, it's an interesting kind of thing if you can reflect a bit on, and I, it weaves us back into the why a little, of in what way do we use our whole selves artistically for a purpose? There's a purpose to it. You want a consequence to happen in relation to something, but you can't have the consequence carry. If you know the outcome, you're probably not going to do it, right? If you know the outcome of the of the work unto itself, yes, you can't do it. You, you can't no do it. it. You're just like, well, then it's just it's pointless. There's no energy there. It's like you can't. So you, the unknown pursuit of an outcome, and yet a belief that the impact of meaning can carry across time and place, and uh, ignite, unite, and do something where the neighborliness of strangers become part of the work itself too. So that pursuit of an unknown outcome with a belief that your own urgency to raise the resources, to be in the studio, to find the team, to do all of those things are there for a reason and it's a singular set of... So what are those reasons for you, Julian? I mean, let me You can answer. change your mind tomorrow. You can, yeah. <laughs> you have to yeah. be consistent. Tomorrow. <laughs> I, think, I think what I... Or what I would like to say is that um, I feel that we are more and more in this very moment losing, um, th uh, you know, values we, we, we thought were there for granted. And yeah. this has to do a lot with language. And it has to, has to do with the fact that I, I like to say that the, the word is the avant-garde of the action. So there's first the word and then the action follows. And that you can study very well in those manifestos. But you can also, on the bad side, let's call it simply like that, study it in nowadays populist politics, where all of a sudden the framework in which we started to express ourselves and that we thought to be a civilized framework of, ex of expression left to right is defined by values that are in our constitutions, that are there because we are human beings and we learned uh, over 5,000 years of civilization or whatever how to behave and how to deal with that, at least we thought that. And all of a sudden, that framework, there's actually a theory about that called the Oberton theory, where um, all of a sudden you have somebody who's leaving that framework by far, somebody like S uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil or Trump here in America, Salvini in Italy, or Orban in Hungary, and so on. The list is endless, or uh, getting bigger every day. And he repetitively, those a word out of that framework of civilization. And then what happens is all of a sudden that frame gets bigger and people say, look, okay, I can say that now. I can say refugee tourism. 
I can see fake news. I can say, sorry, not see. I can say that. I can allow myself to say that. And that's extremely dangerous. And I'm saying that because I want to come back, of course, to manifesto, that what I learned from these beautiful writings in this text is that they are loud and angry, but they're always within the framework of civilized thinking. They're inspiring. They're echoing in your mind. Uh, they, you carry them with you after you listen to them. And that is the exact opulism of the hello nothingness of anger, anger of populism, of that, of that anger. And so I think, and again, coming back to this idea of call for action, sorry, I'm speaking so long, but um, I think that what, if the piece addresses us as individuals, it says engage. And don't just wait, step back, and let things happen, because let's call it the other side, engages in a far more tricky and mean way, and all of a sudden the world becomes in like split seconds another one. I mean, can you follow up with this, what's happening? I like, tomorrow's election day in Brazil, my wife is Brazilian, we are scared to death. A fascist is becoming the new president of Brazil, probably, uh, praising torture and killing gays and whatever. It's impossible to imagine. And this happened for a reason, because this framework of civilized language has been expanded too far, and we have to defend it. And um, I don't know why, uh, how, and I don't know if the art context is the right context, because we are talking to our friends all the time. That's a dilemma of the world we are activists in, that we are only addressing people that don't need to be convinced with all our fantastic political ideas and, and opinions. We are just talking to the wrong audience. I'm talking to you. You're my friends, in a way. And so how do we actually reach the audience that needs to be convinced, that needs to be addressed? And maybe in this case, Kate's fame, let's call it like that, helps a little bit to widen the audience and at least bring in a few Lord of the Ring fans. A few populists? <laughs> a few hobbits. A few hobbits <laughs> into the museum. Anything I can do to help, Julian. <laughs> Sorry about the long answer. It's, it's, that's great. That's a great answer. And, you know, Kate, you're involved in a lot of causes as well, right? The cause of theater, the cause of cinema and film. You don't, art, ideas, architecture, various things, but climate. And that's a big one in your world. I mean, when you and Andrew were running the Sydney Theater Company, the greening effort of that space and facility was astonishing. And the thing that I watch in your work, not only in the context of you know when you're performing and making your work, is there's a there's possibly a choice to make things more difficult, right? To make them more complex, to give them more dimensionality, to not go, I'm going to move to this direction for another film, but I'm going to take and run a significant international regional art theater for a number of years and amplify the capacity of how we're awake to our, each other in the world through a live space, the projected space, the work you've done with choreographers and various others. And so it's a choice around the, I suppose maybe um, not taking a path of least resistance, but utilizing your capacity in service to other cultural possibilities, including the environment. And if you'd want to speak about that, that would be great. Well, yeah, and specifically to, to, to greening the theatre company, yeah. when, when we came up with this concept, which was our initial, one of our initial ideas, you know, we wanted to internationalise the company, wanted to green the company. The thing that everyone balked at internally within the organisation was, what does this have to do with making theatre? And our argument was that if, if we as an arts organisation disconnect from one of the greatest issues that is facing us as a species, we will vast, quickly, very quickly become irrelevant. And you know, when you, when you have a, a, a group of captive people who've paid for their tickets, but they're, but they're there to have a good time, and they realise that they have actually have zero footprint in doing so, that it, it kind of combats that, that narrative around climate change, that it's all about sacrifice. Um, and so we thought that that was a really positive one. And there was a, uh, we, you know, there were many other things that we, we wanted to achieve. Uh, and we thought this, in 10 years, this will be the, the last one we, we do. But in fact, we did it within two years. Because at that particular juncture, there was a real will around it. Yeah. But talking about language, yes. um, which is really, I mean, you know, the, the, notion, the notion of evil 
the word evil really changed under the Bush administration. And I think under this administration, although if you go all the way back to Phyllis Schlafly with the ERA, the notion of belief coming in to f mm. uh, uh, replacing the word fact, mm -hmm. you know, that we can believe in facts, mm -hmm. it's a, that, that concept really does my head in, right. you know, because belief is about miracles, it's about religion, it's not about facts. Mm -hmm. And so I, I found, uh, I, for me, it was a bit of a red rag to a bull with the, the whole climate change uh, issue because I, I you know, I, there was an organization, the CSIRO, who have, you know, done extraordinary um, things with preservation and scientific research. And I saw them in my lifetime being lampooned mm -hmm as a kind of a, 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 a hippie, far left organization. Yeah. And so this is scientific research, mm -hmm. you know, and so then, yeah, came mm. from there.